Okay, so starting chapter 8, um, section 8.1 is an introduction to something called relations. Um, so in, in math, anyways, a relation is just a, a collection of ordered pairs, ordered pairs being an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, and in such a way that y is somehow related to x, right? And, you know, that's sort of the abstract definition, mathematical definition, but it's basically any, any two concepts that are related, right? So, so if you look at example two here, we have um, your zip code, right? So wherever you live, you have a zip code, and then your student ID number, right? So these are both numbers, of course. They don't, you know, they don't have to be, but since, this, since it's a math class, we're going to mostly deal with numbers here. So we are relating your zip code to your student ID number, right? So that's one example of a relation. All right, so X could be the, the year that it is, and then Y would be the average population in Norwalk, Connecticut of that year. So you're relating the year to the population, the number of people on average that live in that city in that year, right? Um, so if you take a ball and you, and you drop it, right, it's gonna fall, and you can measure the height of the ball at any given time. So if X is the time, Y is the height, these two things are definitely related. So, but let's go back to just the idea of we have a whole bunch of um, ordered pairs that form a relation, okay? So I'm gonna draw a picture here that might help a little bit. Um, so let's look at example one a little more carefully. What we have is these ordered pairs, negative five, and, well, let me copy it down, I guess, right? Negative five, three. So what we're, what we're saying is x is negative five and y is three. We have another ordered pair, 1 and 4, so x is 1, y is 4. Um, then we have x is negative 2, y is 0. And we have x is 7, y is 3. And finally, x is 9, y is 4, right? So just some random collection of ordered pairs. Don't read anything into this, right? Don't, don't try to find any pattern here. There, there probably isn't any. So it's just a collection of these. Uh, oh, there's, I'm, I'm missing one. I'm missing one. Uh, oh, one and three, I think. Yep, I forgot the one and three. So there's there's six ordered pairs here, one and three. Right. So, and it doesn't matter what order they're in, as long as we have all six of them. So that's one way to think of a relation, right? And, you know, you can just draw a picture here. This is just a collection of numbers. I think I need to make it a little bit bigger. Right. And then we have another collection of numbers, right, over here. So. So here we have a collection of numbers, and these are going to these are going to be the x's. So the x's here are negative five, one, negative two, seven, nine, and one. Although we already have one, so I can write one again, but that would be redundant. We already have one up here. Right? And over here we have the y values. So these are the y's. So we have the numbers three, four, zero. Three we already have, so I don't need to repeat the three, and we already have four as well. And we already have three, so it's really just these three numbers here. Okay, so the collection of all these numbers here, right, and in fact you can write it as a set as well, the set of negative five, one, oops, negative two, seven, and nine, this set of numbers here, this is called the domain. Right? The domain is simply the collection of all possible values of x. Right. right, And over here, for the y values, we have the set of just these, oops, sorry, the set of, let me try that again, this should be a brace here, a little brace. So collection of these three numbers here, these are the y values, so we call that the range. Okay, right, so this is not the relation, this is just a collection of numbers for the domain and a collection of numbers for the range. What's the relation? Well, it's how these numbers are related, right? So in the original uh, set of ordered pairs here, this is, they're insisting that negative five is related to three. So negative five is related to three, these are connected. So I'm gonna show that connection just by drawing an arrow from one to the other. So this is saying that negative five is related to the number three. And we get that because of this arrow here, right? because of this ordered pair here. Right. On the other hand, um, 
1 is also related to 4. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 1 to 4. Okay, so that's, that's this arrow. Um, what about negative 2? Negative 2 is related to 0, so I'm going to draw an arrow from negative 2 to 0. See how that works, right? So this little diagram here is just reproducing the information we have here, just maybe in a, in a way that we can visualize a little bit better. All right, uh, what else do we have? We have 7 is related to the number 3, so I have to draw an arrow from 7 to 3, and uh, so I hope you don't mind crossing arrows here. So here's 7 is related to 3, so that's this uh, ordered pair here. Um, and I'm running out of colors, but let me try this one here. 9 is related to 4, so 9, we're going to draw an arrow from 9 to 4. Okay, and we have one more. Let me see what color can I use here. I can use orange maybe. So one and three. One is related to three, so I have to draw, an, uh, you know what, I'm going to pick a different color here. Um, how about, how about uh, deep blue? So one to three here, right? So you're going to see, draw an arrow from one to three, and that's for this ordered pair here. Okay, so you kind of get this little spaghetti diagram with all these arrows going from X's to Y's. So this is just another picture, and this is one that you'll see in the book. Right? But it's the same information that's contained in, in this collection of ordered pairs here. This is, might be a more visual way to represent that, but that's, that's all it is, right? So either way, this is a relation. Okay. All right. So what I want to do now is talk about the idea of a function, and I might be getting a little bit ahead here, but um, this is probably a good time to talk about, in section 8.2, we have things called functions. Okay, so what is a function? So I'm going to bring up the definition in just a second, and then I'll explain what that means. Okay, so here's the definition of a function, right? So it says a function, right? Here's function. So a function is simply a relation, right? So it's a collection of ordered pairs in which every number x that's in the domain corresponds to exactly one number y in the range, right? So if that's a little confusing, I'd like to rephrase that a little bit here by stating that a function is, we have a function if no two distinct ordered pairs share the same x coordinates. Okay, so that's what makes a relation a function. It has this, this extra condition, right? So not every relation qualifies as a function. So it's extra condition here. So that's writing function. So we have this extra condition, and so if this is true, it's, the relation is also a function. If this is not true, you have a relation, but not necessarily a function. Okay, so now I what I want to do is go back to this example here and ask the, the logical question is, is this a function? Right. We know it's a relation, any collection of ordered pairs is automatically a relation. But is this condition satisfied, right? Does it qualify as a function? So let's look at it from the perspective of these ordered pairs here, right? If we look at all the x coordinates, right, do we have any two ordered pairs that share the same x coordinates? So we start with the negative 5, 3. We have a 1, negative 2, 7, 9, 3, 1. So I don't see another negative 5. So negative 5 is the only x-coordinate for this relation, right? Let's go on to this ordered pair. We have 1, 4. Do I see any other ordered pair where x is equal to, to 1? Not here, not here, right? Nope. Oh, here we do, the very last one, right? So you can tell that both of these ordered pairs share the same x-coordinates, okay? 
they are distinct ordered pairs in the sense that, right, the y's are not the same, right? But the x's are both equal to 1. So for a function, that's not allowed. No two ordered pairs can share the same first coordinate. Well, they do here. So the answer here is no, right? This is not a function because we share the same first coordinate. The x coordinate is the same for both, right? Okay, so that's what makes this a function. In terms of the diagram here, here's what you're looking for. This number one has two arrows emanating from it. It has this blue arrow. Maybe I should draw that a little bit clearer here. We have this blue arrow coming from the one, and then this little purple arrow here, or violet, whatever, coming from the one. So that means that we have two different y's sharing the same x. That can't happen not for a function, right? It's a perfectly good relation, right? This is still a relation, but it is not a function. Okay, All right, so what would make it a function is if this, if this one and three weren't here. If I got rid of that, now all the x's are distinct. Now they're all different. That would make it a function. But if you include this, this one, three here, the one, four, x equals one, y equals four, Right? Th these two order pairs share the same x-coordinate, and that cannot happen for a function. Okay, so that's the idea of a function. Okay. And we can go back to these other examples up here and ask the same question, are these, are these functions? Right? So example one, we already know that example one is not a function. So question, are these functions? So example one, we already determined the answer is no. What about example two? Right? So, so we have our x's and oops, let me let me try it this way, right? Example two. So we have our x's and y's, right? So I'm gonna make a little table here. Um, right, so x's, these are zip codes, right? And then these are students. Well, student ID numbers. Okay. So Let's suppose we have a student uh, that lives in zip code 06855, and their student ID number is 0171728. I think I'm missing one, but again, these aren't real students. These aren't necessarily real zip codes, but um, I'm just making them up. Right, and we have another student who lives in zip code 06125, and their ID number is 019222, okay, right. Now, it can happen that we have another student who also lives in the same zip code, but now it's a different student, so they have a different ID number. Right. And then we have uh, another student that lives in another zip code and again has a different student ID number. All right, and we'll do one more, right? So same zip code, different student. Seven, six, right, that's a four. Right, so, so we have a list of, of students, uh, sorry, list of students on the right and a list of their corresponding zip codes on the left. So remember the condition, right? No two ordered pairs. So we think of these as little ordered pairs here, right? This is my x, this is my y. So I could write this, for example, as, oh, I'm gonna run out of space here, 0, 6, 8, 5, 5, that's the x, and then the corresponding y is this number here, oops, 7, 1, 7, 2, 8, right? And then this ordered pair here would be 0, 6, 1, 2, 5, comma, and then 0, 1, 9, 2, 2, 2, 2, and so on, right? So you can see the issue here, right? Remember the condition is that no two distinct ordered pairs can share the same x coordinates. So that's, that's like saying no two students, no two distinct students can live in the same zip code. Well, that's not very practical. I mean, that's gonna happen. That, I mean, I would say, you know, in, in, in our school, there are a lot of students with the same zip code, right? 
So, so because of that, they share the same x, right? They share the same x here. Oops. But they have different y's, right? So the same thing that happens here, right? And in fact, here too, same x, two different y's. So we have two distinct ordered pairs um, that share the same x coordinate. So, so likewise, um, this is not a function. Now, it actually depends on whether, right, whether you, you want um, x to be the student and y to be the zip code. If you do that, if you reverse these, then that's a perfectly good function because you can't have the same student with two different ID numbers, um, not legally anyway, um, and, and, you know, the, it would be the same zip code. What one student would share that would be in the same zip, would be in their zip code, but you can't have one student with two different uh, ID numbers, right? So that would be a function, but that's that's just switching these, right? Um, let x be the year. So example three, right? Let's look at this one now. Um, x is the year and y is the average population. So the question is, in a given year, can you have two different size populations of a city? Well, I mean, sure, you know, people come and go, so at any given day, the population might be different uh, from a different day. So over the course of the year, sure, the population is going to change, right? You know, people leave, people move in, move out, come and go, you know, so, so that's fine. However, we're talking about the average. If we take the average over the whole year, then that, that daily population that changes all gets averaged out. And you calculate the average for that particular city in that particular year, and you have your average population. Right? So it doesn't make sense to say in the year, let's say 2018, that the average population was both, you know, 2 million and 1 million. That can't happen, right? So for that, for that reason, this is a, this is a reasonably well-defined function, right? And I'll let you think about the fourth example. The fourth example is also a yes, right? If you release a ball, right, you measure the height at any given time, Right, since the ball can't teleport, it can't be in two places at once. It can't have two different heights at the same time. Right, so so for that reason, it's also a, considered a function. Um, so that should give you the idea of a function being a more spec specific relation. Right, so not all relations are functions, but all functions are because they're ordered pairs. They are relations. So I hope that helps. Okay, so now I want to go back to relations for a minute and look at something called their graphs. So you, you've graphed things before, I presume, um, but not in the context of relations or functions, I think. So, right, so if you have a relation, so let's look at an example of the graph of a relation. So this is just a relation. And remember, a relation is a collection of ordered pairs, right? So if we have our, uh, this is going to be pretty tricky, but I'm going to try to draw a vertical line as, as, as vertical as I can here. I know it's a little sloppy. Uh, and here's, I can draw a horizontal line a little bit easier. So that's our x-axis, and this is our y-axis, roughly speaking, right? So we have, you know, let's mark this as 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Then we have negative 1 negative 2, negative 3, and then for the y scale we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and then negative 1, oops, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. All right, forgive the sloppiness, right? So, so a graph could be basically any set of points here would be a relation, right? So it could be this point here, right? This is the point uh, 2, 1. And then way over here, we have the point, uh, say, negative 2, 4, right? So that would be a very boring relation, just these two points, right? So you can have, you can s sort of create a whole continuum of points. You can draw like a whole curve here. It might look like this, right? And then this would also be a relation, right? This point right here might be the point, uh, it's pretty close to 1, 2, let's say. Um, this point right here might be negative 1, ooh, 
um, approximately one and a half, maybe 1.6, I don't know. Um, so this is also, the gra this is what we call the graph of a function, uh, of a relation. Now, is it a function? Well, that depends, not, right? So if we look at a different example, so I'm going to draw this example here. Here's the x, here's the y-axis, and I'll draw a graph that looks like this. In fact, let's make it a kind of a circle, a squashed circle here. So this is also a set of points. This is also a relation. Um, you know, it, it looks almost like an ellipse. That's the shape of a, of a squash circle, but you don't have to know that. Um, right. So it's just a graph, right? It's, it's, and it's a set of points, right? It's a set of points, right? So this is also the graph of a relation. But is it a function? Well, let's see. If I pick any x, this x over here, do I get one y value? Well, I get this y, say y1, but I also get this y over, well, let me try that a little bit better here. I also get this y here, y2. So I have x and y1 and x and a different y, y2. Oops. Sorry. x and y2. So I have two distinct ordered pairs sharing the same first coordinates, and that cannot happen for a function, right? So, for that reason, this is not a function. Not a function. It's a relation, to be sure, but it's not a function. On the other hand, here, you can imagine that every x corresponds to only one particular y value, right? So, in other words, if I, if I draw any vertical line, I'm just going to pick a random vertical line here, and it's going to be very hard for me to draw a vertical line, but I'm going to do my best... Oh, that's not bad, right? This vertical line happens at a particular x. It's roughly negative one and a half. And it crosses the graph only once. It has only one y value, one y value for that x, right? Likewise, if I draw another vertical line at this particular x, say x2, um, that happens at only one y value, right? So any vertical line, if it crosses the graph only once, then it's a perfectly good function. So this is a function. But here we have a vertical line. Um, let's, well, any, any vertical line. Let's take this one here. Uh, not quite vertical, but let me try one more time. Okay, that's better. This vertical line crosses the graph twice. So for that x, say x2, you're going to have two different y's here, right? So that's why it's not a function, right? So this leads to the idea of what's called the vertical line test, right? So if you give me a minute, I'm going to put up the definition of the vertical line test. Okay, here's the, what we call the vertical line test, right? So the vertical line test, right, is used to determine whether your graph is a function or not, right? To determine if the graph represents a function and not just a relation, we use the vertical line test. Right? The vertical line test says that the graph is a function, or rep I should say the graph represents a function if no vertical line crosses the graph more than once. Okay, So for it to be a function, every, every vertical line must cross once and only once. Right? So, right. so we've already seen this... Oh. Again, vertical line from my x, or from my y, is my x, right? So we've already seen this, this basic shape here. If you just have a circle, for example, a circle is definitely not a function, does not represent a function, because you can draw a vertical line pretty much anywhere, and it's going to cross more than once, right? Oh, you can, you can find one line that crosses just once right here at the edge, we call that a tangent line, um, where it does only cross once. But the condition is that you can have no vertical line crossing once. If any vertical line crosses more than once, it's no longer a function, right? Okay. So, so let me just draw 
very, very quickly here, three graphs. Well, and we'll see if they're functions or not, right? So the first graph might look like this. Uh, here's a graph that looks like this. Okay, and then we have a graph that looks, oh, let's say it looks like this. Something rather complicated here. Um, let me try that again. Uh, okay, and let's say this is closed, this is open here. And this is this goes forever, right? So you be careful. The arrow just means it goes on forever. It's not really part of the graph, right? All right. So I have three relations, right? They're all relations because they're all just a collection of points, ordered pairs, right? But are they functions? So that's the question. Are they, do they represent functions? Well, right. Use the vertical line test. If I can draw any vertical line. Anywhere I draw it, does it cross more than once? Well, here it crosses once, 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 once. Yep, I think every vertical line crosses only once. So the answer here is yes. This is a function. This is, or this is the graph of a function. Right? Forget the fact that I ruined it by drawing all these vertical lines. I'm just doing that uh, to leave nothing to the imagination, right? OK. What about here? Uh, is, this is a relation. It's a collection of points, a collection of ordered pairs. Is it a function? So if I draw this vertical line here, you can see that it crosses only once. Right? But that's the exception, right? If I draw this vertical line, it crosses here and here. It crosses twice. Right away, that alone says that it's not a function. That destroys the functionness of the graph, if you will, right? And of course, you can draw another line here that crosses way more than once. This line crosses one, two, three, four times. So, yep, as long as it crosses more than once, it's not a function, right? No vertical line can cross more than once for it to be a function. So this, definitely not a function. All right, this one here is a little bit trickier, but it's the same idea. If you draw a vertical line here, it crosses once. If you draw a vertical line here, it crosses once. If you draw a vertical line here, it doesn't cross anywhere. But remember, it, it, it can't cross more than once. Crossing nowhere is not more than once. That's crossing zero places. So that's okay, right? It, right? So, so yeah, here it crosses once, here it crosses once. Here it doesn't cross anywhere. Here it crosses once. Um, so it crosses at most once. Some places it doesn't cross at all. It crosses zero times. But as long as every vertical line crosses at most once, right, and that could include crossing zero times as well, um, right, that makes this a function. That's, right, so this is a function. Yeah. Right. So... Yep, so I hope that helps using the vertical line test to at least distinguish between um, graphs that are functions, like the, the first and the last, and then graphs that are not functions, like this one here. Okay, so one more concept from 8.2. So we're going back to 8.2 now. And this is how we represent functions mathematically, so this is function notation, the notation for functions, and this, this takes a little getting used to uh, if you haven't seen this before, right? So all that stuff before about these weird looking graphs and these um, little diagrams with arrows and so forth, or ordered pairs, not typically how you see functions, right, or relations. The way we're going to see a typical relation looks like this, right? So y equals 3x plus 2. Right? So this is an example of a relation. Right. How is that? Well, right, remember, a relation is a collection of ordered pairs. So the ordered pairs here might not be obvious, but if I pick, and right, x could be anything, 
if I pick some number for x, let's suppose that x is equal to, I don't know, 5. I, I just pulled that out of the hat. Don't read any, anything into it. Um, if x is 5, we can calculate what y is. y is 3 times 5 plus 2. Oops, 2. Let's try that again. And so 15 plus 2 is 17. So there's our ordered pair, right? x is 5, y is 17. So this is my x and y, right? So again, like I say, I just picked 5 out of the hat. We can pick some other number. How about uh, negative 3? So if x is negative 3, I can calculate y. y is going to be 3 times negative 3 plus 2. So that's negative 9 plus 2, which is negative 7. Right? And so there's another ordered pair. All right. So, you know, you can pick even weird numbers like 1 third. Or, or, yeah, okay, 1 third. So y would be 3 times 1 over 3 plus 2. So that would be 3 over 3 is 1, so 1 plus 2 is 3. So we get the ordered pair x is 1 third and y is 3. Right. So, yeah, they don't have to be nice whole numbers. They could be fractions too, right? All right, so this is definitely a, a relation. It's a collection of ordered pairs. Now, these three ordered pairs, of course, are a relation, but it's a much more boring relation, right? So I want to distinguish between this example here and example two, which is this. One third and three. Okay. So notice I got this from the previous example, uh, these three ordered pairs, and yet this is not the same relate, right? This is a relation, but it's not the same one. And you might, you might ask why, because, it, I mean, I got it from just using this equation. Well, that's kind of the point, right? Um, this, this real, I just picked these three numbers sort of at random. Why didn't I pick x equals, I don't know, 0, or x equals 205? I don't know. I, I just didn't pick those, right? But those are part of this relation as well. On the other hand, this is much more boring. There's only three numbers for x and three numbers for y. In other words, the domain, right, is just all the x's. It's just these three numbers, 5, negative 3, and 1 third. And then the range are just the corresponding y values. Um, let me try that again. The y values are 17, negative 7, and 3. Right. On the other hand, what's the domain of this relation? Well, it's the set of all possible values of x. And I can, I can pick any x I want, right? So the domain of this relation here is all real numbers. I can pick anything I want, any number you want, right? right. So the mathematical way to write all real numbers is the following. This is interval notation from negative infinity to positive infinity. Right. Imagine you have a number line here, right? So here's a number line. These are all, all values of x, 0, 1, 2, oops, 2, 3, and so on. And then in the negative direction, you have negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So when we mean all real numbers, we, we mean not skipping over anything, right? We want all of these numbers here going all the way to the left, which is in the negative direction, and then all the way to the right, which is in the positive direction. And when you mean all the way to the right, you mean you just go on forever. So the, the symbol we use for forever, meaning we, we never stop, is infinity, right? And if you go in the negative direction, that's negative infinity, right? So we'll come back to interval notation later. Uh, right now, we want to concentrate on what is the domain and range, right? So here the domain is all real numbers. And even though it may not be clear to you that the range will also be all real numbers as well, um, so, yeah, so how, how do I know that? Well, I know that because the, the graph of this, if you remember, is just a straight line. So I'm going to try to do that here. Right, so here's y equals 2. I might be a little sloppy here, but... Right, so I'll do this in green. So, yep, 
when x is 0, y is 2. When x is 1, y is 5. When x is negative 1, y is, well, negative 1. And so you connect the dots, and you get this somewhat straight line. I'm, I'll do the best I can here. Right. So, right, so now you can see that for the x values, the line keeps going to the left right forever, in this direction forever, and it keeps going to the right forever. So that's for the domain. Those are the x's. Remember, the range are the y values now. So let's look at what happens to y. Well, the line also goes up forever, so that's positive infinity, and it also goes down forever, that's negative infinity. So by looking at the graph, it's a lot easier to figure out the range. You look at all the y values, right? Okay, so I hope that helps. Okay, so now I think I want to get to actual function notation here. So I'm going to scroll down and rewrite this function that we had earlier. Um, or, e I'm sorry, relation. We didn't, we didn't say it was a function yet. So y equals 3x plus 2. Let's go back. That's what I got from here. So we said it's a relation, but is it a function? Is this a function? Hmm. Well, there's many ways of answering that, right? Remember, no two distinct ordered pairs can share the same first coordinate. So if x is 5, can y be, you know, 28? Well, no, right? When x is 5, we, we did this. y is 17. It can't be 28. And unless you make a mistake and calculate it incorrectly, that's not going to happen, right? So for any given x, when you plug that into this formula here, that, that value of x, you get a value of y, but only one value of y, right? So the answer here is yes. This is actually a function. Another way, to, another way to determine is, remember, use the vertical line test. We drew the graph. If you draw a vertical line and it crosses only once, here it crosses just once, then it's a function. If I draw this line, yep, that only crosses once. If I draw the y-axis only crosses once, right? Every vertical line crosses at most once. In fact, it crosses exactly once. Even this vertical line right here, you might think, well, that doesn't cross anywhere. Actually, yes, it does, right? Because the line keeps going. So eventually, because the line keeps going, it will cross this vertical line right about here. So every vertical line crosses once, but only once. That's why this is a function, right? Oh. And as such, we're going to write this slightly differently here. Instead of y, right? Here's the key thing. Instead of y, we're going to write the symbol f of x. So this is the same thing as writing f of x equals 3x plus 2. Okay. Now this, this takes getting used to because you, typically when you see parentheses like this, right, we tend to multiply, right? So this means 3 times 7. But this is completely different. This is not f times x. You're not multiplying f times anything here. For one thing, f is just the name of the function. It's a label. Right? It doesn't make sense to multiply a name times you know, a number. Right? So, so yeah, be careful that even though this is parentheses, f it does not represent a number. Right? x might be a number. That's, that's true, right? x might be, you know, 5 or negative 3, like it was up here. Right. x could be 5, could be negative 3, could be 1 third, or it could be any real number. So x will represent a number, right? Um, and y will represent a number, but f is not a number. f is just the, the label or the name of the function, right? It's just the name of the function. I'll write it a little bit neater there, right? So, yeah. Um, so what exactly does this mean then, right? So we're going to think about a function in a slightly different way. We're going to think about it as this little machine here. This is my function, f. And it has a little slit slot here for an input. You can put something into the function. And then you get a little 
uh, slot here where something comes out of the function, right? So you put something in, you, that's the input, and something comes out, that's the output. Right? What goes in? Well, x goes in. What comes out? The y comes out, right? So y is going to be the output, x is going to be the input, right? So, for example, if this is my function, let's say the input is the number 5. What number comes out? What is the output? So we did that way up here. We plugged in x equals 5, and we calculated that y is the number 17. So if 5 is the input, that means 17 is the output. Okay. And a more concise way to write that is just to say, well, if I take f and apply it to the number 5, right? right? So I'm, I'm plugging in x instead of uh, uh, 5 instead of x, then the corresponding y value is 17. So this is just another way to, to express the fact that 5 is x and 17 is y, and this is our ordered pair. Okay, but we're thinking about x as going into the function and 17 as coming out, right? So, you know, let's say the number negative 11 is my x, that's the input, what's the output, right? What's the output here? So let's just use the actual equation of the function, right? This is the definition of the function. We know that f of x is equal to 3x plus 2. So what I'm doing is I'm replacing x, I'm substituting for x the number negative 11. Okay, so so how do I get y here? Well, I do not multiply f times negative 11 because that's meaningless, right? f does not multiply anything here, right? f is just the name of the function. Instead, what we do is if we change this x to a negative 11, I have to change this x also to negative 11. So this is 3 times negative 11 plus 2. And I know I just said that th these parentheses does, do not mean multiply here. But it does here, because these are both numbers. So this is actually 3 times negative 11, or negative 33. And when you add 2 to that, you get negative 31. So that's the output, right? If the input is negative 11, the output is, oops, sorry, negative, let me try that again, negative 31. Right? But again, the more concise way to write that is just to say f of negative 11 equals negative 31, which is also the same as saying x is negative 11, y is negative 31. So these are all three ways of expressing the same idea, that 11, negative 11 was the input, negative 31 is the output. So, so I hope that helps. That just sort of is the idea of function notation here. Okay. So, a little more complicated example. Suppose g of x is the function 6x divided by x minus 3. And for now, we just want to calculate or evaluate the function at various values of x, right? So, one last time, let me show you what we're doing in terms of the picture here. We have a function g, we have the, picture, uh, the, the machine g, and what goes into the function? Well, starting with example a here, 0. 0 is the x. We want to calculate y, right? So if x is 0, what is y? That's what this means, right? Remember, we are not multiplying g times 0, okay? So what this means is everywhere I see an x, I'm just going to replace x with the number 0. So this is 6 times 0, although I could use parentheses, right? 6 times 0, divided by 0 minus 3. So 6 times 0 is 0, 0 divided by negative 3, is just 0. And that's my y. So if x is 0, y is 0. Right? So the answer here is just 0. Right, kind of boring, because the input happens to be the same as the output. Now that, that usually doesn't happen, but it happened here, right? So let's go on to example b here. Um, so here the input is the number 1. So 1 goes into g, what comes out of g, right? So if I replace x with 1, I get 6 times 1 divided by 1 minus 3. So that's going to be 6 divided by negative 2 
which is negative 3. So if the input is 1, the output is negative 3. Okay, so far? So far, so good. All right, um, let's do one more. How about g of 2? So we don't need the picture here anymore. All we need to do is replace all the x's with 2. So instead of 6 times x divided by x minus 3, I now have 6 times 2 divided by 2 minus 3. All right, so 6 times 2 is 12, and then 2 minus 3 is negative 1, so 12 divided by negative 1 is negative 12. Right, so that would be the output if the input was, was 12. Oh, I'll draw the picture one last time. Right, 2 goes in to g, and then negative 12 comes out as the output. Negative 12, right? So for part c, the answer is just negative 12. And in fact, you know, you can do this, you can do this here, of course. I'm just, I just might run out of space. This is 6 times 2 over 2 minus 3, so you get negative 12, right? We got the negative 3, of course, from, from doing 6 times 1 divided by 1 minus 3, right? And the same thing with the 0, which we did over here, right? All right, so let's go on to part D here, because this one's going to be um, a little more interesting, as you'll see. So to calculate g of 3, again, don't multiply g times 3. That doesn't mean anything. Instead, we're replacing or substituting for x the number 3, right? In other words, 3 goes in, and then what comes out? What number comes out, right? So to calculate this, we're going to replace... Instead of 6 times x, it's now 6 times 3, divided by 3 minus 3. So the numerator, 6 times 3, is 18. The denominator, 3 minus 3, is 0. So what's 18 divided by 0? Now, I can, I, can, I can hear some of you thinking 0, but remember, if you take 0 divided by a number, you get 0. 18 divided by 0 is not a number. There's no such number. It's, it's meaningless. It's an undefined concept, right? It's not a number, right? And the reason is because if you think it's 0, right, the way to check this is to multiply 0 times negative 3, which, of course, is 0. 0 times negative 3 is 0. That's correct. So if you think this is 0, then what number, right, times 0 is 18? So 0 times 0 is not 18. 18, sorry. Right? So it's not 0, it's not 18. Anything times 0 will never be 18. Right? So, so what's the answer here? It's, it's not a number, then it's, it's just left as undefined. Right? So the answer is undefined. Right? In other words, the input is 3, there is no output. Right? There is no output. Nothing comes up. Right? This machine, this function, doesn't know what to do with this number. It, it, it says, okay, I'm going to accept 3 as the input, but I don't know what to do with it because I'm, I'm trying to calculate this and I'm ending up with nonsense. 18 divided by 0 is, is not a number. It's nonsense. So it doesn't know what to uh, um, um, uh, produce as an output. It, ba it basically just spits out nonsense, right? It, it's like an error. It's, it's like on a calculator will give you an error when that happens, right? So... So g of 3, the, the answer you should put, of course, is undefined. That's the answer for, for g of 3. Okay. So we'll come back to this in a minute. Let's go on to g of 4, and then you'll see the, the rest later, right? So if I take 6 times 4 divided by 4 minus 3, I just get 24 divided by 1, which is 24, right? So, so for, most, for most x's, for most numbers, you get a perfectly good number y, this is our y, is the output, right? But you can see for some x's, in particular for x equals 3, we don't get an output. We get undefined. It's nonsense, right? Okay. All right. So very quickly, let's do the last three here, right? This is, uh, I'm sorry, 6 times 5 divided by 5 minus 3. So that's 30 divided by 2, which is 15. Um, if you have 6 times negative 1 divided by negative 1 minus 3, you get negative 6 divided by negative 4, 
which reduces to 3 over 2, right? You don't have to get nice whole numbers. I mean, this is a fraction, obviously, so some of the answers will be fractions. Uh, 6 times negative 2 divided by negative 2 minus 3. This will be another fraction, negative 12 over negative 5, um, which is in lowest terms as long as you cancel the negative, so 12 over 5. Or for those of you that like decimals, right, you can write this as 2.4. Likewise, you could have written this as 1.5 but um, we prefer the improper fractions here, if that's okay. Um, especially when you have a repeating decimal, then leave it as a fraction. Don't write the repeating decimals. Okay, so this is going to lead us to a very important concept. We already talked about domain and range, right? Um, so what happens here is the following, right? The domain, let me write it this way here, the domain of this function g, domain of g of x, right? And let me rewrite the function, 6x over x minus 3, right? So remember, the domain are the set of inputs when you have an output. If you don't have an output, this 3 should not have been an input in the first place, right? It's gonna, if it's going to give you an error, the best thing to do is don't plug in 3 in the first place, okay? So... So essentially, we think of the domain as the set of the good inputs that produce an output. If it doesn't produce an output, it's not a good input. It's not in the domain. Okay? So for the domain here, we've already said that 3, this number 3, is not in the domain because it does not produce a number for the output. Okay? And it turns out that's the only number that's not in the domain. Okay? So the way to find the domain when you have a fraction like this, when you have a numerator and a denominator, right? So to find the domain, uh, to find the domain of a fraction, let's say numerator and denominator, right? If that's my function f of x, right? You're going to do two things. You're going to set the denominator equal to 0, and if you remember, this is not the first time we've done that. We've done this before, right? This finds the restricted values. Remember, how do you find the restricted values? You look at the denominator, you set it equal to 0, and then you solve for x. And if you get any solutions there, those are restricted values. Right. So it's a related concept, but it's actually kind of the, the opposite of that, right? The domain, then... Right, is going to be the set of all real numbers x such that right, the denominator is not equal to 0. In other words, the domain is everything except the restricted values. It's, right, basically, we're going to throw out the restricted values. Throw them out of the domain. They're not allowed. They're not invited. Okay, throw out the restricted values, and then all the other numbers are in the domain. So in this example here, right, 6x over x minus 3, what do we do? We set the denominator equal to 0. Now the denominator here, um, the d here, is x minus 3. Right? So x minus, oops, sorry, x, let me try that again. x minus 3, set it equal to 0 and solve for x. You can do that in your sleep, right? Add 3 to both sides, and we get x equals 3. Right, so that is our restricted value. But that's not the domain, right? That's not the domain. The domain, to get the domain, it's everything else. It's the set of all x, right? So the domain is the set of all real numbers x such that x does not equal 3. Okay, so in other words, 3 is the only restricted value. It's the only number that is not in the domain. So here's another way to look at that, right? Let's draw our usual number line, right? And let's mark off the numbers. We have negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, sorry, 6, 7, you get the idea, right? 
So what numbers are in the domain? Well, maybe it's, it's better to say what numbers are not in the domain. Three is not in the domain. So here's the number three, so we have to remove the number three here. So I'm going to just erase it. Maybe not the number, but the point on the number line. We're going to erase that. Right? So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with a hole, right? a little hole here, because we removed the three from the domain. We removed the restricted value. We threw it out, right? Throw out the number three. And so the domain then is everything else. Everything less, that's not equal to three. So everything less than three, right? So to the left of three, this is all x less than three. And then everything that's bigger than three as well. These are also in the domain. x is bigger than 3, like 4, 5, or 6.7, right? Decimals are included, right? So the only number that's not in the domain is this 3 itself. That's the only point that we threw out. Okay. So one more thing. We want to write this using what's called interval notation. Right. I started to mention that before, but now I, we're doing that again. Interval notation. And don't get confused with function notation. That's, um, right, that's expressing this right here, right, g of x or f of x, right, that's the function notation. Okay, but um, so here we're looking for interval notation. So we want to express all numbers that are less than 3 and notice that if you go to the right, if you go to the left rather forever, that's in the negative direction. So that's negative infinity. Okay, negative infinity here, right? And then we keep going to the right. Oh, but we have to stop at three. In fact, we stop just before we get to three. Right. So we have to indicate where we stop. We stop just before three. So if we don't want to include the three, we use a parentheses. Right. So the parentheses means we exclude 3. Okay, But this is only numbers that are less than 3. Right, This is the same as x is less than 3. We also want to include numbers that are bigger than 3. So if we start at 3, again, we don't want to include 3, so we start just after 3, just after 3. And then we keep going to the right forever. That's in the positive direction, so we get positive infinity. I mean, you could put a plus sign if you want, but it's not, it's not required. Right? Same thing with 3. You don't have to write plus 3 to indicate that it's a positive number. Right? Right. So we're going to join these two intervals together. We're going to form their union. So this big letter U stands for union. I know I'm writing sloppy here. Right, so U stands for U stands for union. It's the it's the union of these two intervals, right? So, yes. Uh, so that's the interval notation for this. And this might seem like a easier way to understand what the domain is. It's all numbers not equal to three. This is telling you exactly the same thing, just a different way to write it using interval notation, right? Because if you're including all numbers that are not equal to 3, that means you're including all the numbers less than 3, that's this on the left here, or all numbers bigger than 3, that's this thing on the right, the 3 to infinity. So the only number you're skipping over here is the 3 itself. The 3, we threw that out. It's gone, right? So we're not including, we're not including the 3 because these are parentheses. If you do want to include 3, and I'm running out of space here, um, so let me go, yeah, let me, let, me, let me just erase all this, and then I'll come back and show you if you do want to include 3. Okay, so yeah, so let's do one more example. Um, so suppose we want to write the set of numbers, let's say x is, let's not use 3, let's use uh, yeah, x is less than or equal to um, negative 1, right? So, you know, we know what that looks like. So here's negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 
3, and so on. Right? So here's negative 1 right around here, and we want everything less than that, so that's to the left. We highlight everything to the left, right? and including negative 1, so there's no, there's no hole here. We include negative 1. Right? So we want to write this, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that question. We want to write this in interval notation, right, in interval notation. Okay, so the way to do that is to, well, look at the number line here. We're including all numbers going to the left forever. That's in the negative direction, so negative infinity. And we're stopping just at negative 1. So we have parentheses, negative infinity, and then comma, and we end up at negative 1. Now, if I write parentheses here, now we're excluding negative 1. But this equal sign, this equal sign here, means we want to include negative 1, right? So, so I can't use a parentheses. To indicate you want to include a number, you use a bracket, a square bracket like this. I made that maybe a little too big. That's a little better, right? So this means the same thing as, right, x is less than or equal to negative 1. So if I want to write, let's say, um, x is greater than or equal to negative 8. So now, well, here's negative 8. If you want everything greater than that, then that's to the right, right? So here, we're starting at negative 8, and then we're going to infinity, right? Now notice, infinity is not a number. Infinity is just an idea. It's a concept, right? which means you never include it. There's no brackets around parentheses, only around numbers, and only if you include the numbers, only if you have an equal sign here, right? So what if we want to include, or what if we want to write um, all numbers x that are greater than 0? Right? So here's the number line. Here's 0 right in the middle. And we want all numbers bigger than 0, right? But not 0 itself, right? So in other words, we want to erase... 0 itself, and leave a little, little hole there. Uh, it's kind of a big one, but I'm, you know, I'm exaggerating, obviously. So, yep, in this, in this case here, of course, uh, there's no equal sign. So we're not including 0. So we're going to the right forever to get to infinity, but we're not going to the left forever. We're stopping just before 0. So we need parentheses to indicate that we're not including 0 in this case, right? right. All right, one more, one more. Um, suppose we want to indicate all numbers not equal to um, negative 1 half. Okay, so what would that look like in interval notation? So here's the number line, right? So here's negative 1, here's 0, here's 1. So negative 1 half is sort of halfway in between. It's, it's right about here, right? Right about here. Halfway between 0 and negative 1. Right. So again, that's a hole because it's not equal to negative 1 half, but that includes everything less than negative 1 half and, or everything bigger than negative 1 half. So here we're looking in both directions. We want x is less than negative 1 half or x is greater than negative 1 half. So here, we need to go from negative infinity to negative 1 half. And let me try that again. Negative 1 half. Right, no, no brackets because we're not in, right, there's no equal sign here. Or it's not equal to, right, it's not equal right, to negative 1 half. There's no equal sign here, right? Or there shouldn't be. There we go. That's better. Um, or, so or means union, and then starting just after negative one-half, so no bracket there, parentheses, we're going to the right to positive infinity. Okay, so, so I know this takes a little getting used to because this is a lot, a little more clumsy uh, than this, but this, this is clear, right? x does not equal negative one-half, so it's every number except negative one-half. All numbers, all real numbers, the only one we're throwing out is the negative one-half. But this means the same thing, right? This means the same thing. All we're saying here is that either x 
could be less than negative one-half, or it could be greater than negative one-half, but that means it cannot equal negative one-half, because it doesn't equal here, and it doesn't equal here. Okay, so, so that's interval. This is all interval notation, and so it just takes a little, little getting used to. Um, and in fact, we're not going to be include for especially when you're finding the domain. Remember, we're not going to be including the numbers, so you're not going to use brackets at least in this section here when talking about the domain of a function. Okay, so when we found the domain down here, we threw out the number three, and because of that, neither of these were equal to three. So there should not be a bracket anywhere here. So I, I hope that helps. Um, yeah. And I realized this was a long video, um, but this, I was covering both 8.1 and 8.2. Um, so 8.1 was relations, and 8.2 was functions. So for the most part, most of the problems are going to come from functions. And in particular, finding the, you know, evaluating functions and then finding the domain and then using interval notation. Okay, so that's going to be in the homework.